lovelies, and welcome back to Listen Closely, Season 2, Episode 2. As always, no matter where you're listening from, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the whole host of others, uh, always make sure that you hit that subscribe button so you can be notified for these uh, shows. We do post them every Saturday at 8 a.m. Unless something's going on, but then we will always uh, let you know. By letting you know, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. YouTube, yeah. And I think that's all of them. It's it's kind of hard to remember how many we have. But all of them are at HTT Listen Closely. Uh, YouTube's, I believe, just Listen Closely. And this is a very cool podcast today because we are actually doing this podcast from the brand new home studio. We are. This is the first one. So hopefully they can only get better from here. We might have some pet sounds. We are working on attempting to get the pets out of, you know, the studio. But right now they're all sleeping, so hopefully there shouldn't be any bad sounds. This episode that we are covering today, it is a sensitive topic. Um, so I just want to warn everybody right now, it is a true crime. So this episode will have uh, discussions over rape, sexual assault, murder, and, you know, just that kind of things so if you do not want to listen to things like that don't blame me at all you do not have to listen to this episode but we will be discussing this for this episode and because of this episode being what it is i did go ahead and tell you about it to kind of get you ready for it yes so um and it is a local case we are talking about mary Catherine edwards who recently made the headlines here in our area yeah. So Mary Catherine Edwards was born July 9th, 1963 to Lum Edwards and Mary Ann Edwards. She was a elementary school teacher in Beaumont where she graduated from. So she stayed local. She did her passion. A lot of students said that she was a very loving, caring woman. And, you know, you just felt the love in, this, in her smile. So we're just going to go up into her final day. Miss Edwards was 31, and she was last seen alive Friday, January 13th, 1995. Uh, Floyd Broussard, which was her principal at the elementary school that she taught at, said that she was a diligent teacher. She normally stayed after school a little late to, you know, prepare her lesson plan for the following class, which a lot of teachers do. They want to make sure that they are ready for their kids for the next time that they see them. Especially on Friday, you don't want to have to work during the weekend so you want to prepare everything so you can have it ready to go on monday so according to the reports edwards was last seen leaving the elementary school around 5 p.m and that was the day she was slain so it's this is all the same day she then went home walked her beagle as usual and poured herself a glass of wine before calling her boyfriend and that phone call was probably the last time anyone really spoke to her right the next day, she did not respond to phone calls from her parents or really anyone. So her parents went to check on her in her townhouse to make sure that she was okay. Unfortunately, her father, Lum Edwards, went upstairs to find a horrifying scene. Mary Catherine Edwards' hands had been handcuffed behind her back and she had been sexually assaulted. Her partially clothed body was draped over the edge of the bathtub with her head in the water and her legs on the floor, meaning that the person drowned her. Right. She had about three dozen injuries to her body, indicative of the violent struggle, and they even found finger-shaped bruises on her hips. The shower curtain had also been knocked from its place, and in the bedroom, the bedding had been torn from her bed. Mm. So, uh, obviously, she did not go down without a fight. She, she fought hard until the very end. Right evidence was at the scene though they could not really match it to any one person they ran it through i mean this is the days of so this happened in 1995 so these are the very early days of dna they're still trying to you know perfect it and it's nowhere near the dna that we have nowadays like the technology right so because of it being the early stages of dna technology they were unable to get a match So then they started to look into her past. All of us know that during true crimes, you know, like usually it's like the boyfriend, the husband did it or, you know, an estranged lover or things like that. So that's the the police started to look into, you know, who could have possibly done this. 
she actually had a very clean background. Right. Her main things in life were church, gym, and of course her uh, students. So they they really didn't have any leads with that because, you know, everything checked out. She wasn't, you know, a, in a sketchy area or, you know, had lived a sketchy lifestyle. That was just simply not her. She was a very well-rounded, sweet, comfortable lady that you could just, you know, you love to be around. Right. I mean, she was a teacher. Like, right. She was one of the best teachers from what I hear. Like, right. You know, she did her job. So this is in all in 1995. They had no leads. They couldn't figure it out. So right. it went cold. So in the mid 2000s, due to the genetic profile of uh, Edwards killer, they re-entered it into the FBI's combined DNA index system or CODIS. We all know CODIS is, you know, if you are a sexual offender or rapist or any of that or even a murderer, they will automatically enter your DNA into CODIS. So that way it can be shared across, you know, the state lines and everything. So that way they can solve more of these cases. Right. So they entered that DNA uh, from the killer into CODIS and there was still not a match. Which hmm. means that this person hadn't committed a crime and was caught and sentenced for it. Right. Doesn't mean that, you know, they're Scott clean. It just means they haven't been caught yet. Uh, so they just, they really hadn't just found the right person yet. Their thought was, you know, the more and more people are entered into this, hopefully we can one day find the killer. Right. Which, you know, it's, DNA is a beautiful thing in that sense because, you know, you can submit your DNA and find these killers and match these killers to cold cases and solve a lot more of them and people can get, can get closure. And let me let me stop you there because that's that's something that's quite interesting to me because you know you're talking about CODIS and what people don't realize is that like we're not talking about people that get like parking tickets and like people get pulled over by the police for speed speeding tickets. Right. Like CODIS you have you have to be fingerprinted, you have to have your, you know, all your stuff in the system. These are people who have done horrible stuff like right. murder attempted murder stuff like that so with that idea now you're thinking okay this person wasn't necessarily a person that you would consider a bad guy right like i mean he wasn't like, he wasn't the person that you know you considered automatically right. this is possibly somebody who sat next to you in church on a normal sunday morning which right. is creepy but so, eight years later, from this mid-2000s CODIS, the district attorney took office and said, you know, this cold case is his top priority, which, you know, you love to hear that because, you know, the family's still hurting. They still want answers. They still don't know who took their loved one away. You know, it might be a cold case, but that doesn't mean it's forgotten. It just means that they've hit a dead end and they need more time and they need more advances in technology, such as the DNA. Which, surprisingly, is how this case was solved, was because of the advances in DNA and how readily available it is for uh, genetic uh, genealogy testing. That's actually how we found this killer. So, if you don't know, I mean, you should know, but, you know, the 23andMe, the uh, Ancestry.com, those websites make it readily available. I mean, people get those kits those dna kits as gifts i mean i believe your parents for one of the christmases they got one of the kits am i correct yeah they both got one yeah so like everybody is getting these kits now i mean everybody's now curious of where they come from and their dna makeup i mean that's just one of those cool things that you know it, the dna technology has advanced so much that literally anybody can get these kits and do them right i we have a i have a friend uh jacob he literally just got one and the only reason he got one is because he's curious. He wants to know where he came from. Right, which is everyone. I mean, yeah. ev it's human nature to want to know where you've come from. So because of these kits, it gave investigators an opportunity that they've never had before. Yeah. So they submitted this killer's DNA to a private forensic lab in the woodlands that specializes in DNA testing for police agencies. Hmm. Unfortunately, because it was 1995 and we're now talking about, you know, 
2000s, the DNA evidence in this case was fairly degraded, but they were able to still extract a tiny sample of the killer's DNA from the evidence still in storage. So they luckily, they caught a break there. Uh, the cold case investigators then plugged the suspect's DNA profile into, I don't know if it's called GED match or GED match. I really don't know which way it's supposed to I be mean, said. I mean, the initials are GED. Right. So. But anyways, it's a public genealogy database that has become a super important tool for investigators over the past several years now that, you know, this DNA genealogy thing has hit such, you know, it's it's big time now. Yeah. And it's a free site. Anybody can upload their their results from their genealogy into this website. So once the investigators uploaded the killer's DNA uh, from the lab into this database, they were able to reverse engineer the family trees for the suspect. Right. And this is a practice that many investigators do all across the United States. They will reverse engineer the family trees of unidentified suspects in cases such as murder and sexual assault. You know, they try to solve these cases. They were able to uh, create these trees to narrow down the suspect pools. And then they were able to, you know, figure out who was of the right age and geographical location at the time of these crimes. Because of that, investigators get DNA from their suspects to either confirm or eliminate them as, you know, suspects. Right. So it's really helpful. So in this Edwards case, several of the killer's second cousins and other distant relatives showed up in the database from both the maternal and paternal side. Okay. So they, I mean, they basically were able to narrow it down pretty far. So then they obtained DNA samples from about 30 distant relatives who were more than willing to cooperate. I mean, I don't know if somebody, if I, so I've never done one of these DNA kits. And if I ever did, and then they're like, hey, you know, you are related to quite possibly a suspect in a murder case or cold case, yeah, I would want to submit my right my yeah. DNA to help that family. So because of the fresh samples from these relatives, they were able to connect the dots and they narrowed it down to two people. The two people were Clayton Bernard Foreman and his brother. That's how super close they were able to connect this. Okay. Then they started to go into the, you know, the criminal history of both men. Foreman's brother had a, like, really clean record. The nothing popped up. Nothing was, you know, out of the ordinary. I mean, he was just a regular guy. So they are like, okay, well, that's one person. The same was not really true with Foreman having a squeaky clean, you know, no criminal history background. A little side note, he and Mary Catherine Edwards went to high school together and graduated together. Okay. So they were classmates. So that kind of gives you a little connection. Also, she was a bridesmaid in his first marriage. Oh, wow. In, um, I believe it was 1982. Yes. So he married his first wife. And then that wife had Mary Catherine Edwards as a bridesmaid. So she was a part of his wedding party. Yeah. So they had a personal connection. Yeah. Like they were, they were acquaintances. I right. don't know if, how close they were. But they at least knew of each other. I mean, they went to school together, and then she was a part of the bridal party. Yeah. So that already kind of connected them a little bit, but still, they were unsure of everything. So Foreman actually pled guilty to assaulting a fellow high school classmate in 1981, the year before he got married. So that was a year before Mary Catherine Edwards was a part of the bridal party. Wow. So he's already got a you know, sketchy past. Uh, According to the court documents of that case, Foreman met up with the woman who was stranded at the gas station, said, hey, you know, I'm a police officer. I'll give you a ride home. But instead of taking her home, he stopped his car, tied the woman up with a belt, holding a knife to her throat, sexually assaulted her. So that already gives you a lot of similarities from that 1981 case to Edwards' 1995 case. Right. Foreman had claimed to be a police officer in that 81 case. And in Edwards' case, the suspect utilized police tools of the trade. I mean, she was handcuffed. Right. Probably had handcuffs. Yeah. So that's already starting to not look good for him. He did plead guilty to aggravated assault and received three years probation in that 1981 case. And then, you know, basically got to live his life. 
I mean, we know 1981, so 1982, he got married yeah. to his first wife. They did divorce, uh, and then he went on to keep going. But after learning about this previous sexual assault case, the investigators tracked Foreman to his home in Ohio. So he moved away. Yeah. Like, he's no longer in this area. I wouldn't really be either if I might have done something. Right. But they tracked him down to Ohio, and they were able to collect some trash from the cans on his curbside, which a lot of people think that's pretty sketchy. Actually, if it's on the curbside in public road, it's full-on access. You can get it. Yeah, not only that, but investigators do that all the time. Yeah. Well, yes. And some, like I said, samples. some people yeah. say, well, that's not right. You're taking property. It was trash. That's how they're solving these cases. So right. they did that. They collected DNA off of some of the items within that trash can, and it matched. <laughs> he was the person who entered her home, bound her hands behind her back with handcuffs, sexually assaulted her, and eventually killing her. Wow. Um, As we stated, they were classmates, and some of the other classmates of both of them were actually pretty shocked. They thought he couldn't possibly have done this because he was um, planning the reunion party. Yeah. And he was in charge of the uh, memorials of the classmates who are no longer with them. So they thought it was kind of a, no, not him. You know, you always hear that. Couldn't possibly be them. They're just too nice or they're doing this. What kind of person do you have to be to be the memorial planner for your graduation party and knowing that one of the memorials that you have to plan is because of you? Right. So, like, I... That that just blows my mind. It is definitely a very... It's it's an odd one. Yeah. Because I don't know if I would really plan that I'd probably be like, you know what, can I just be on decoration committee or right. something like that? Like, it, it takes a special kind of evil to do something like that. Yeah. Her former students all remember her for her smile, her kindness, and her generosity. Uh, if you came in without snacks, she would go out and buy them with her own money. Right. I mean, she was just that kind of a teacher. Yeah. So, as we stated, this actually recently made the headlines again. Because this is very, very recently that they were able to connect Foreman for her murder. Yeah, it really amazes me because of this new technology and a piece of trash, they were able to track down this killer. Right. Like, and so my question now is, is that how many more is this system going to be able to find that have been cold cases for decades? Like, And I mean, it really kind of depends um, because unfortunately... Sometimes the DNA evidence just disintegrates. Right. I mean, it really depends on how well preserved that the items are kept. I mean, obviously, in a humid Texas locker, you know, somewhere, it's probably not going to last as long as like a well preserved. I mean, I'm not too sure on DNA. I'm pretty sure it has to be relatively cooler for uh, it to last, yeah. but I actually have not looked into DNA storage. So I'm not too sure. But I'd imagine, as anything else, you know, the colder it is, the better well-preserved it is. And some areas are just not equipped for that. Right. So as of June 16th, 2021, he is now brought back to Texas into Jefferson County for trial. There you go. So this case is not done. Yeah. They still have to go through the trial process and the sentencing if they find him guilty. I don't see why they wouldn't. But there's still a process that you have to do. Right. But as of right now, he is back in Texas. He is no longer in Ohio. He is sitting in the Jefferson County Jail awaiting his trial. I'm not sure when that will be. They've, you know, obviously it just happened that he came back. So there's no um, real say of when the trial will begin. I don't believe it's been set yet. They're still probably trying to gather their case together. And we will hear soon, hopefully, when that trial starts and hopefully get the correct verdict and sentencing. You know, this this case is a really, it's a horrible case. But because all this happened, he will now be entered in CODIS. So if he has done anything else other than the 81 case and this 95 case, it'll be brought up. Yeah. I mean, like I said, he is now forever entered into CODIS. So if another case does come up that is tied to him, they will at least now have closure. And there's no telling how he entered our home. 
I mean, he could have said he was a police officer like he did in the 81 case. But yeah. because they had that connection, I don't personally think that's how it went down. I think he might have, you know, stopped by. She knew who he was, possibly invited him in, and then the struggle happened. Yeah. yeah. But we don't know. She's not here with us to tell us what happened. So we only have to rely on what he says. And, of course, he's going to spend it. Of course. To be, oh, well, it's not that's not how it happened or whatever have you. I mean, but then you, again, you never know. He might have killer remorse and could tell us. You're very well good. Um, that's a rare thing that happens, but it does happen. Or maybe he'll, you know, tell us more for a reduced sentence. There's there's really no telling until this child actually comes forth and they talk with him and see where it goes. So this will this one will be definitely one that we'll have to update on uh once everything is said and done and how everything ended up turning out. Right. But I do want to get your opinion on on this whole case. So I think that and this is just me personally um I honestly think that first off uh pay respects to the family of miss um edwards and her family um i know that you know a big part of this right now is they can finally breathe some sighs of relief because they found the person that did it and right. that that's a big thing because there are a lot of people out there who are still going through the motions because they don't know who killed their loved one or their family member and at least he's off the streets so he right. can't harm anyone exactly. else exactly um I think personally that, you know, one of the big things that you always talk about and something that I want to bring to it as well is that, you know, we talk about the killer, but we really want to memorialize the victim. And that's, uh, I just, I'm glad that they found the guy that actually did it. I'm glad that they are using this DNA technology and, and they're doing their due diligence to find these killers now with this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an amazing process and something that I, I want to look more into. The other thing about it is, is that, you know, personally, I mean, there's no question about it because the DNA is there. He did it and he should be tried and to the highest extent of the law and put in jail or, or whatever, whatever the jury decides. Right. So, that's kind of my statement on it. I, I mean, I I don't know other than just remorse for this wonderful family and this wonderful, amazing teacher who went above and beyond for her kids and was an amazing lady. And that's was just taken. Yeah. Taken from us. Right. So that's all I got on that. And that's why I really didn't I didn't delve too much into his life because it's not about him. Right. This episode is like the previous true crime, it's not about the actual killers themselves. Right. But we do this for the victims. Yeah. And to, you know, share their story that might help others. And, you know, maybe somebody hears this and they know, you know, and that that's the big thing. It, it, it helps people because maybe somebody hears this and they know of a, of a true crime that needs to be solved. And they're like, hey, you know, like you said, they're, they're relatives. Like, hey. Maybe I should go give my blood. Maybe I should help try to find these killers. Right. You know? I mean, you don't automatically think, you know, I'm giving my, you know, I'm doing my genealogy and I, hey, I could help solve a case. Right. You don't. Because, you know, I was not really too interested in doing these genealogy kits. I mean, I basically know where I came from. Yeah. But, you know, after seeing cases like this, it's like, wow, you know, you never know. Maybe my DNA could somehow along the ways help right and it might not be that a, a crime that's happened in the past it might be a future crime yeah and once they enter this dna they'll be like oh well hey you were a relative we're trying to help solve this well i do believe that is all for this episode like i said it was a very tough one to cover and talk about but it needed to be discussed yeah not for the killer but for the victim and hopefully, like I said, this trial does bring some sort of closure for the family. It is not going to bring their loved one back. We know this, but hopefully it gives them some peace. Right. And that's all we can ever ask for. 
Yeah. As always, we ask that you do one thing and one thing only, and that's listen closely.